Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you guys doing? A welcome to the 12th session, probably somewhere midway through the whole series of the critical sira, where we employ the interdisciplinary method to try and decipher, understand, appreciate the life of the greatest man who's ever lived, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And in the previous session, we spoke about some of the marriages of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In fact, uh, some contentions that are related to them, but also some of the narratives that we find in Sirah in general, we understand uh, more about the wives of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We already covered in some detail, in fact, Khadija bint Khawailid, the first of the wives of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the Meccan period. And just to get your guys in the, cl- in, the, in the room here, to get you guys, your juices flowing, let me ask you a question. Who, who, which wives did we cover, Uthman, last week? Uh, we covered a few, one of them being Aisha. Yeah. And her, yeah, go on. And her, sorry. Yeah. Um, Sophia. So, 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 Sophia. 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 Yeah. Um, There's someone before Aisha that we covered. Yes, um, Khadija. Yeah, we, yeah, that was before, but before before Aisha in that session. Who did we call? Soda. Mm. Mm. The one which Aisha loved the most. Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, tell me something about Soda and Zama. Um, she was. She and Khadija are the only two uh, wives of the Prophet who um, uh, weren't in a polygamous relationship with uh, the Prophet. So interesting. And tell me something more about Soda in terms of. Uh... She had five children. Okay, interesting. And um, she, I believe she uh, married the Prophet after. I believe it was one year after. The yeah, death. one or two years or after. Two years after okay. the death. Yeah. Um, anything in particular? You tell me. I mean, uh, I'm leaving it open to you. Oh, All right. Okay. Like um, and there's a, obviously there's a, one of the hadiths you mentioned mm. uh, was obviously her her size. Um, yeah. And I think just just from a uh, like a wife perspective, that's why Aisha uh, liked her the most. Um, she wasn't threatened by her. She, as much, yeah, yeah. From yeah. She was older than. When her, we talk about kids, jealous love. No. Yeah. 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 We spoke about jealousy at, at great length and how the the connection between jealousy and love. But we won't go into that now. Let me ask you, um, well, let's play a game actually. Let's get everyone involved. Let's play a game. And the game is, let's uh, <laughs> name the wives of the Prophet, okay? And what we're gonna do is we're gonna start from this side of the room. Okay, so, no, 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 wait, wait, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there's 11 wives of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We want, especially if you're going to mention Zainab, there are two Zainab. He had Zainab two wives. Called, yeah, sure, sure. But don't, don't give them the answers, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, that's going to be your answer. But anyway, yeah. just one name per person. Just to get our juices flowing once again. So go ahead. Zainab bin Jah. Go on, next. Aisha radiallahu anha. Yeah. Khadija. Okay. Uh, Try and get the full name. Maria al-Qubtiya. Okay, well, that's a difference of opinion. Well, we said the majority opinion is that Maria wasn't actually a wife. So go, go again. Okay, um... Uh, let me try to think. Okay, we don't have all day, brother. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Um, Bint Aoun Khattab. Uh, What's her, well, Amr al Khattab's daughter. What's her name? The daughter of Amr al Khattab. She's already been mentioned. Uh, been mentioned. No. No. Amr. No. No. Oh, oh, sorry, Amr. Oh, Amr yes. Khattab. What's her name? Yeah, what's her name? Uh, Hafsa. Oh, that's beautiful. Excellent. Sophia. Sophia Bint, Bint Hay. Hay. Yeah. Good, good. Sauda, 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 Sauda bin Zama. Yeah, got you. Uh, um, um, Salma. Yeah, Salama. Salama, yeah. Salama. Yeah, sure. Uh, for extra points, I'm not going to ask you for her actual name. Uh, that will be pushing it, we'll, uh, but it's good. Fine, correct. Okay, good. Jawariya bin Talharit. Yeah, you see, it gets harder now, isn't it? <laughs> These guys here have it harder. Okay, Jawariya bin Talharit. Who else? Uh, I'm cheating. Uh, Maymuna, yeah, uh, bin Al Harith. Ha, same thing, right? Yeah, yeah. Maymuna. Okay, now the Sheikh, I won't get him involved. This is uh, petty. <laughs> Go back. <laughs> <laughs> no, you had the easy one. Zainab uh, Thani, Ma'afus Ma. Zainab Radana. I don't know. I don't know. Bin to what? I don't know. Khuzayma. Khuzayma. Have we covered all of them? No. Oh, my wish was the Sheikh. Oh, my wish. That's right. Yeah. And in fact, there, there might be there, there might be another one. Uh, which we'll talk about today, which there's a difference of opinion whether she was a wife or not, which is Rahana bin Zayd. We're going to speak about her today as well. But these, these are the wives of the Prophet Muhammad according to Ibn al-Qayyim al-Jawziyah. 
So we've covered four of them in some good detail. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, like not all of the wives of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you have that many reports. Like uh, you'll see, but when we speak about Rahana bin Tazayid, even if she is a wife, we don't even know she's a wife. But there's effectively no reports on her. Like I, I tried to find any Sahih reports. It's nothing. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> like almost nothing. So once again, some wives have a lot of stuff and have what, some wives have very, very limited information about them. Today we're going to be speaking about um, another wife, but before we get to that, we are covering, because it's a critical seerah, we are covering the wives which there is considerable contention around, you see, because we need to be able to defend the honor of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and they, like anything else, right, if someone wants to attack another person, you go for the family affairs. It's a, it's, a, it's, it's a very successful strategy. You try and warp those things, okay? So we need to, in order to us to defend that, because it paints a very bad picture of someone, okay? This person's a shahwani, this person is a desirous person. All they care about is desires and so on. But once we understand how to historicize these events, then we can respond in a way which is more sophisticated, historically sophisticated. So we spoke about Aisha. Before we move on to Zainab, in fact, Bin Tajash, not Khuzayma. Uh, we are going to ask you a question about Aisha because it's such a big shubha nowadays and it's such a oft-repeated contention that I think it, we, and we need to interleave, as they call it in pedagogy, the interleaving is this idea that you know when you finish with an idea in one session that you bring the session up again because repetition brings about uh, acknowledgement and it's, it strengthens the andragogical process. So the question is, if someone, let me play devil's advocate with you bro, yeah? If someone, I don't know, this chair is very squeaky, don't worry, I'll change it in time. But um, if someone were to come to you and say, you know, if Islam is true, then why is it that your prophet consummated a marriage with a nine-year-old? Where's the issue? From where are you basing your morality from? Okay, that's a good way to start. That's a good way to start. I'll say, look, um, isn't it wrong? Could you, could, it's totally wrong for a grown man at that age to marry a nine-year-old. I'd say we don't actually look at the age. It's not that important Islamically because the age, even like here today, mm. geographically changes. What's more important is Qawad. But she was a child. In our definition, would it be? And I think even in your definition, you'll disagree that she's not a child. What's your definition? What do you mean? There's a few Qawad in Islam, which I think is. Well, I don't understand these words you're using. Oh, sorry. There's a few principles. <laughs> there's a few principles where yeah. if they go past that principle, then they'll be accepted as adulthood. We don't actually have the concept of teenager in Islam. Okay. Is child adulthood. See, that was good. I, I like that. I like it. But there's a there's a key word that we used last session that so Tarek knows what it is. Puberty. Okay, but there's another key word that I think it was it's, said. It's Ahmed, pieces, what did you? What you said the word was? Social function. Yes. Bring that word in. Yeah. Say so your your definition of adulthood as 16 or 18. Make it very clear. Is a social construct. Social construct. So what, what, this we said this is an argument from social construct. Mm. You see. So to bring about the fact, and you say, look, there's historical forces at play, and childhood wasn't seen as this yeah. before. One of the most powerful arguments to bring about, or to, to show, showcase, demonstrate that this is a show, social construct, is simply to show that cross-culturally, historically, the idea of adulthood wasn't a 16-year-old. As simple as that may be, it's very powerful. What's it cross-geographically as well? Mm today yeah. yeah and you have many countries that accept it beautiful excellent so that's one argument so morality is a good argument the way you could approach that is like i always try in a debate mm. or in general to to force someone to two options you know i think it's a very good way to get yourself to a position where you're victorious effects essentially yeah so what you would do is, like, for example, there's two ways of doing this, and I've discussed it with Ali at length, I've discussed it with many of you guys, but just to remind you, with the Aisha issue, you take it to their own morality. So, for example, I would say, look, the fact that this is wrong, in your opinion, is this categorically wrong, or is this consequentially wrong? So they have to choose one of the two. They can choose, okay, consequentially, categorically. There's not a third option, actually, if you think about it, because categorically wrong means it's wrong in all places and all times. In which case you have to prove that. So if they say it's categor if they, they have to pick their poison, yeah? So if they say it's categorically wrong, they say, fine. Prove that it's ca categorically wrong. So they have to try and do some Immanuel Kant moves and try and philosophize that, which is very, very, very difficult. And if you know how to fight in that area, you'll win. 
And if you say it's consequentially wrong, the consequence that they're going to attach it to is what? Harm. harm. And for them to say it's harm, what they have to do? Look at the sources. They have to prove it. Yeah. So the burden of proof is upon the one that's making the claim. I'm saying, okay, well, you have to prove that it's harmful. So, you know, I don't have to prove anything. Any nine-year-old, any, they have to use universal statements. So, well, actually, you're using a source, which is that she was nine. So you might as well use all the sources and prove that she was harmed as well. Because if you've got to chuck away the sources, then chuck away the source that says she was nine. She might not have been nine, she might have been 18, 21, 50, uh, 50. Whatever you like. So if you want to chuck the sources away, chuck all the sources away. But you can't selectively choose sources. If you're saying it's harmful, then it should be as clear as the fact that she was nine. So you have to, now the burden of proof is upon the one that's making the claim. So that's one way of doing it. Now think of how, how you would create this um, dualism or this dichotomy using the social construct argument. So you can ask, how, how would you say, how would you exhaustively make the point? So there's either, history. Hmm? History. but how, put it as either A or B, how would you say that in this, using the word social construct, how would you make an argument? Well, you say so, what is an adult, right? Oh no, we're asking them a very open question. You want to give them two choices, what choices would you give them? So uh, it's either <coughs> oh, always wrong for a nine-year-old to get married, or no. But that's so. That's the other one. That's the consequentialist versus categorical one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So look. What about if you tried since, yeah. uh, Simple. Is out of a number or uh, principles, and then you push them. You're, you're, you're on the right track. You're definitely you on the right track. Using the word social construct, how would you construct this argument? Social construct. Uh huh. The idea of an adult is a social construct. Yes. Or being an adult is a fixed number. Beautiful. Uh, that, 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 that's excellent. That's excellent. So you give them an option now. Is it a social construct or is it an objective reality? Mm. If they say it's an objective reality, now what? They have to prove this, which is impossible. Very difficult. And whatever way they try and prove this, it's going to be hard for them. Or you can put it another way. You can say, look, adulthood is either based on social construct or biology and if they say biology then they can't say it's 16 or 14 or 18 or whatever. if they say social construct so the next question would be why should we use one person's or one people's social construct as an arbiter for objective morality do you see so what you're doing is you're trapping them so i, I just thought it would be good to start with that because obviously um it's it's a shubha that keeps coming up and the main thing in a discussion or a debate or an argument or anything like that is for you to be asking the questions and giving the options. The moment you're given the options is the moment you're in the back foot. You can answer a couple of questions and stuff, but you have to get back in the center of the ring. Effectively, you have to, you have to get back into the center of the ring. Yes, that's what you have to do. You have to establish the center, which means you have to be the one asking the questions. You have to be the one throwing the punches. And options and stuff is the best way of doing it. Okay, talking about options and talking about controversy. Actually, at the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in terms of his marriages, and this is a subsidiary argument in the first place, the, his marriage with Aisha was not the most controversial marriage. So which marriage was? Zainab bin to Jash. And tell me someone, why is that the case? Because he married his adopted, uh, at that time, his ah. adopted son's uh, wife in the Arab culture that was seen as, yeah, that's your actual son. But Islam said, no, that's not your actual son, so it's halal for you to marry. So yeah. let's, let's um, break this down. We've already spoken about, um, we've already spoke about Zayd ibn Haritha. And in the Meccan period, we know that Zayd and the Prophet Muhammad had a beautiful relationship. It was a very close relationship. And people used to, it was so close that they used to call him, you know, the son of the Prophet Muhammad They used to call him that. But he wasn't the son. He wasn't the biological son. Wasn't he actually considered the son of the Arab culture before the verses came? I mean, he biologically wasn't considered the son because they knew that the father came and there was a story. I'm not sure if you came across or we spoke about it, but there was a story when his father came back and then the Prophet gave him an option to either go with his father or stay with him and he decided to stay with him, which shows you the connection that he had with the Prophet. But the father wasn't around, so he didn't... It's like nowadays when you have a stepdad or something, do you know what I mean? Like, Even though it wasn't like that, because it, you know, he wasn't married to his, his mum. Zayd ibn Hadith's mum. He wasn't married to his mum. But it was the closest thing that nowadays happens is probably that. Yeah? That's what happened after the story. The Prophet announced that this is my son. So yes. he would be called uh, Zayd, Zayd ibn Muhammad. Muhammad. He was called that. 
Mm. And the Arabs actually would consider him his full fledged son. His mm. son. So, so, so that's what, what came later. Islam would he acquire inheritance as well? And yeah, before, before that, people would consider him as a son. So it was considered, as the Sheikh said, as good here, so he's refining the product here a little bit. It's good that the Sheikh is here to oversee what's happening. But it's, he would be considered like, I think you would be right then, according to what the Sheikh said, he would be considered like the son of the Prophet Muhammad. Sallam. However, what happened was the following is that Allah, He sent. Uh, some ayahs in the Quran to try and basically uh, nullify or abolish the practice of um, what's it, what's it, what's it adoption. adoption. Yeah. So a tabani or adoption. He Allah wanted to abolish that practice. So Allah started with uh, it's, This is in Surah Al Ahzab that call them to their fathers that this is more just according to Allah. Meaning, don't do this thing where you're calling someone according to their. To, their, uh, to the other person or another man. And if you really think about it from the objectives of Islam perspective, one of the things that Islam came to protect is the lineage of people. So this makes full sense. Because, uh, you know, we guys know that there's five objectives or six objectives of Sharia according to some scholars. And one of them is Nasab or Nasl or lineage. And so um, the idea that... The idea that... Um, the idea that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or that Allah wanted to abolish adoption it's clear in the Quran. Now, what and happened was... Yeah. It's, uh, it's a good clarification to say that Islam mm. encouraged a person to take care, let's say, of a child, adopt him in that sense. But the main concern and the issue is the issue of lineage. Yes. Mm. That he shouldn't be named uh, as this guy is his father. But, uh, because I, I feel the word adoption may... Mm. Maybe are misunderstood that mm. Islam is against adoption, meaning it's even against a person taking care of an orphan, let's say. Yeah. But actually, that's one of the main things that Allah can be worshipped through. Mm. So I think that. No, no, it's, it's a very important clarification. And I thank you for it. And keep them coming, please, because we make sure that everything is, uh, is clear. So the ayah in question uh, that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, revealed is ayah number 37. Of Surah Al Ahzab. And what we're going to do, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to spend three to five minutes looking at the ayah. So it's chapter 33, verse number 37. And then we're going to come back and take each part of this ayah uh, and ponder over it, inshallah. So I'll give you maybe five minutes to speak to the person next to you and ponder over the ayah. It's ayah number 37. And then we'll come back and, uh, and discuss it together, inshallah. Okay, let's, uh, let's take the first part of the uh, ayah. Um, who wants to tell us what it means? What is the quru lilladi an'am Allahu alayhi wa an'amta alayhi? Amsik alayka zawjaka wa taqillah. What is this uh, saying? How would you translate this? What, what's being said here? Uh, tell the person, um, just, uh, tell the and, yani, tell the person that you've helped, or like, yeah, because Zaid, he helped him quite a lot. No, 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 let's tr translate this translate. first. Translate. For the person that you said to, who you've helped, uh, keep your marriage and stay stable, was that, I think? Uh, okay, let's get a more clean let me translation. Actually, let me get a clean translation, translation of this. The prophet said to the man mm. who had been favoured by God and by you, mm. keep your wife and be mindful of God. Okay, so who's the man? Zaid. 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 Well, we know that because obviously his name comes up. and yeah. His name is the only Sahabi's name that comes up in the Quran, actually. Mm. Literally, yeah. Yes. Um, so okay, that's a great, it's a great honor uh, for him. But let's go back to this. So what's, what is the Quran trying to tell us here? And now Allah Alihi means with the Islam being Muslim. Okay, but uh, what is what is the Prophet telling him to do? Not to uh, keep your keep your wife and keep your what? Keep your wife, right? Keep your wife. Yeah. So what must have been going on at that time? It means there were there was yes. uh, an issue between him yes. and his wife, and they yes. they planned to divorce or yes. something like it, the house isn't stable. Okay, so there was discord yeah. between Zayd ibn Haditha and uh, Zainab ibn Tajash, and so the Prophet's involvement in that was the Quran is stating that you came in and you told them, look, أمسك عليك زوجك واتق الله. He said to, he said to uh, him, which is Zayd ibn Haritha, he said to him, hold your wife and have taqwa of Allah. Okay, does that make sense so far? So we have a discord going on between Zayd and Zainab ibn uh, Jash, and the Prophet's involvement was to try and do salah between them. Now already there's 
telltale signs of the Prophet Sallam, his involvement, is a good one. The shubuhat that come in from this, by the way, what people say is that the Prophet Sallam, he was infatuated with her, he got them divorced, and then he married her. That's the narrative, by the way, right? Mm. There's a lot of questions that come into play here from the first part of the ayah, which is that the first question is, why is he trying to get them, keep them together? If that's the case. Surely, if, like Annie, if I wanted to marry a woman, and there was a discord between her and her husband, and he's telling me about it, keep quiet at least. I mean, maybe I'd even encourage him to divorce. Say, yes, you know what, she's, she's, she's crossing the lines, bro. Like, you know, you need to divorce and then I get married after. That didn't happen. In fact, the opposite happened, you see. So, what were Tell the mar marital problems that they were experiencing? So, actually, I came across some uh, narrations about what, um, what they were. And some of those narrations seemed to be strong enough, which indicate that actually Zainab bin Tajash, because of her placement and like who she was in terms of status, mm. Right, she was from a Qurashi tribe. She was a free woman. She was like all these things, which wasn't there in uh, Zaid ibn Hadith. So she had this streak of, if you like, uh, being above yeah? class, superiority yeah. complex. Yeah. You know, she had a bit of a superiority complex. She actually was the daughter of the aunt of the Prophet. Yes. So she was the cousin of the Prophet. Cousin of the Prophet. So because she was the cousin, I mean, she was from the same tribe, but it can happen. <coughs> That's why a lot of the Fuqaha, by the way, this is a very interesting discussion. They talk about what you call kafa'a. Like for in, and this is an interesting point to pause and think about this, which is that a lot of the fuqaha, when they talk about marriage and stuff, they say it's important for a woman and a man, or a woman to marry a man on a very similar socioeconomic level. Yeah. Because if you marry, if like, for example, a lot of the reasoning they give, I've seen it in like Hanafi texts and stuff, is if she's used to a certain kind of living, mm. then if you can't provide it to as a man, she might... And it's not always the case, but it might bring about this kind of discord because then she might start thinking, I can get the grass is green on the other side. And I'm not going to say that that's exactly what's happened with Zena, but certainly there was kind of uh, this uh, dissatisfaction that she felt with him. Um, because she, maybe she thought she was socially superior. She should be with someone of a different rank. Frankly, that's what she thought. Now, is that a good thing to think? No. Even if she's Zena bin Tajash, can we even, is that blameworthy thing? You could argue that that was a blameworthy emotion and that Zaid, that uh, if she had been more uh, humble, that she wouldn't have had to carry these emotions. You could argue this. And remember, we don't have this angelic idea of the mothers of the believers that they're perfect and they had, you know, perfect idea, yani everything was perfect. You'll see what uh, Aisha does things which are problematic, this wife does things which are problematic and it's natural and it shows you the human emotion. This, this story is natural. Okay. Having said that, we know about Zainab, by the way. And by the way, guess who narrates this? Aisha and Bukhari. We know about Zainab is that she was one of the most religious wives. And she was like one of the best ones. In, in fact, probably the best one. What Aisha says is that she was the best of the wives in religiosity. That's what Aisha says. Can you imagine? Like we know, we've already spoken about how Aisha is so jealous and possessive and all these kind of things and loves the Prophet. But she, even though there was a kind of a rivalry between her and Zainab, you can imagine now, because now we've spoken about what kind of a woman she is. She's a woman that hey, she's uh, got a lot of self-dignity, right? But she's also got a lot of Aizza. So you can imagine now what kind of clash you're going to find between her and Aisha. There was a clash between them. You know, in fact, they both had their own parties of other wives that would, <laughs> would, would there was two conglomerates, there was two parties. Okay, and like Zainab, if you like, le led one group of women and uh, Aisha led another group of women. Right, and they created a rivalry, yeah, because yeah. it's usually those people that have the most grandiose thought process or the most possessive ones that are going to are gonna reach the, the, the heights of that. So that's what happened. There was two kind of camps, the Aisha camp and the Zainab camp. Yeah, it's uh, Salam's camp, but Zainab was within that camp. Oh, really? But there's a narration of Aisha mentioned, uh, she mentioned that he that she was the one that we were both on equal level with. She was the one that we were both on an approaching level, let's say, or yes, at, uh, in the eye of the Prophet. But Zainab and Jash. Yeah, so she mentioned that about Zainab. So mm. that shows something about her. Maybe it was three camps. Um, Salama was no, the no, third um, one. Salama, because Um Salama <laughs> yeah. was so jealous. And really? Even when the Prophet Salama proposed the idea, he got married, married and she, she, was like, she yeah, told him, but I'm yeah. such a jealous woman. I'll make dua for you and all that. Yeah, so. 
Yeah, so the Prophet ﷺ tried to reconcile. So Umm Salama was the head of one camp and Aisha the other. And mm. Zainab and Jahsh was within the camp of Umm Salama. Obviously. Sure. But who, who's, who says this, Sheikh? Because in a way, yeah. you could say that she was the one who used to rival me. Yeah. Could you argue that Zainab had a, headed a camp in herself? Uh, because uh, it's, uh, in all narrations, it's mentioned two camps. Mm. So, really? Yeah. We'll come to that. Mm-hmm. But um, surely sh- there were two uh, strong forces within the wives of the believers. And as you mentioned, she's, as well. she was one of the most religious because we have the narration of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam أَسْرَعُ كُنَّ الْحُوْقًا بِي أَطْوَلُ كُنَّ يَدٍ Yes. Yeah. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was talking about Zainab bin Jahsh. And that particular narration, just to yeah. come back on that, because that's actually an interesting and important narration, mm-hmm. is that it's saying that, you know, the ones who has the longest arm yeah. is going to be the one who is... Uh, Join me. Join me first, meaning he's going to die after me. So the, the women of the believers, they came together and they actually started measuring their arms to see who's got the biggest wing length. But it came out afterwards uh, that actually what that means is that sadaqa, because it's a, it's a majazi meaning, which shows you that sometimes you can have a one meaning that uh, they understood in one way and then afterwards it's understood in another way after the tahqiq of the particular prophecy. Anyway, going back to the point, she was very much, and Aisha, even though she has all this jealousy and she has this kind of grandiosity, she said about her that actually she was the most religious of all of us. She said that she's number one in terms of tahajjud, number one in terms of prayer, number one in terms of uh, uh, um, um, siyam and uh, fasting as well and so on, and sadaqah. Sadaqah, she was known for it. Uh, she had a reputation for giving a lot of sadaqah. Zainab bin Jash. So that, that was uh, that's that's a narration in Bukhari, by the way. Anyway, so the, the first thing is that if we're if we're proposing, or we're, we're presupposing, that, you know, the Prophet ﷺ had this malicious intent to try and get this man who he loved very much divorced to his wife. There's two questions you've got to ask. Why is he telling him to get stay together? The second question you got to ask is, why didn't he marry her before Zaid did? If you think about that for a second, because I mean, if you really wanted to, he could have proposed to her and he would have had a higher chance of getting that yani, that pro- proposal met because he was from the same tribe. Why not just propose to her directly? Why not marry her? Why not beat him to to, to it and marry her before he, she does? Before he does, Zayd ibn Haritha. So it doesn't make sense. But then you read on the ayah. وَتُخْفِي فِي نَفْسِكَ مَا اللَّهُ مُبْدِي وَتَخْشَ النَّاسُ وَاللَّهُ حَقُّ أَن تَخْشَى this is a very important ayah. And in fact, there's a hadith on this particular part of the ayah. This is just a of the ayah, this particular part of the ayah. وَتُخْفِي فِي نَفْسِكَ مَا اللَّهُ مُبْدِي وَتَخْشَ النَّاسِ وَاللَّهُ حَقُّ أَن تَخْشَهُ So what is this? وَتُخْفِي فِي نَفْسِكَ مَا اللَّهُ مُبْدِي So I looked at some tafsir about this. And what it says is that وَتُخْفِي فِي نَفْسِكَ مَا اللَّهُ مُبْدِي And this is, there's two opinions, being honest with you. Some say that oh that he wanted to marry her. That's one opinion. But the stronger, more prominent opinion in tafsir is that Allah told him that he was going to marry her. So the Prophet ﷺ was shy to mention the fact that, okay, Allah told him that, okay, you're going to marry this woman in the future. He was shy to say that. And what Allah is saying is that even though you don't, there's things you feel awkward or shy or embarrassed about, I'm going to expose it. Now, what does this remind you of in the first uh, discussion that we had, in the very first session that we had? The principle of what? Embarrassment. Aha. Embarrassment. Okay. Now, what is the principle of embarrassment? Um, if you, you don't want to say something um, because it's embarrassing, and the principle basically talks about like if it was embarrassing for for someone to say it, they wouldn't say it in the first place. So it actually goes against them. So let's say, for for example, here that um, uh, you know the. the he, he, the prophet wouldn't would, would would keep some certain things to himself um, out of embarrassment, and the fact that he says it shows that he's very truthful in in saying it. Okay, so wh- where is this principle found? Uh, well, the critical history, historical history. Yeah, historical so it's method. part of the it's, yeah. the, it's part of the HCM. Uh, many of many of the scholars, especially biblical studies, mention this kind of thing. You've got the principle of embarrassment, which is that if something is likely to embarrass somebody, it's more likely to be preserved historically. Do you see? So according to the modern historical theories, the HCM, the more embarrassing something is, but it's still mentioned, the more likely it is to be true. And interestingly enough, Aisha herself, 
and I've met, I've looked at and seen other narrations of like Al Hassan al Basri, and they're all saying this kind of thing. If you look at Tafsir of Ibn Kathir or anything other than that, but it is in Bukhari. Well, Aisha herself said that if the Prophet was going to do kitman, if he was going to suppress anything from the Wahi, from the revelation, he'd suppress this. <coughs> so she is affirming that this is the print, this is embarrassing for him, but Allah, he revealed, he exposed him. Why would Aisha, of all people, say this? She would say this because she knows that it's something, she knows the Prophet Sassam's temperament and his character. So she knew full well that, okay, this is going to embarrass him. Why would the Prophet Sassam go out talk about the most detailed aspects of his private life to the community and for it to be mukhalat for tarikh, something which is continual and perpetual in all of history. That, that you have no incentive to do such a thing. People don't want to be vulnerable in that way. And look how Allah, look at the tone that Allah is using in, the, in this part of the ayah. fi nafsika mubdi. And you're trying to suppress in yourself what Allah has already exposed. Allah is going to expose you, effectively. They are exposing this information. nas. He continues, and you fear the people. Look what Allah is saying in the Quran to the Prophet. You fear the people. nas. And Allah is more worthy that you would fear Him. So Allah is he's effectively calling out the Prophet. He's reprimanding them. This is one of the aspects where Allah is reprimanding the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam based on uh, some of the things, his preferences, his temperamental preferences. So that, what, what, what is it? that? Why do you feel this is, why do you feel this way? Why do you feel that if you were to say this stuff in public that you would be, that you, uh, why would it make you embarrassed? And this ayah, this part of the ayah shows you that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu is free from a lot of the psychological things that they attack him with. He couldn't be a psychopath or a sociopath or a narcissist because someone who's that grandiose on that level of on the spectrum of narcissism or psychopathy wouldn't care what people thought. Actually, and uh, it's probably ironic now that I'm mentioning this, there was a series that Piers Morgan done where he was uh, interviewing the psychopaths. And I'm not talking about his recent interviews with the Israelis. <laughs> Although that probably could fit into the same category. But uh, he literally um, was interviewing psychopaths. And if you watch that series, which I don't recommend that you waste your time, but if you can watch some clips, if you ever see an interview with a psychopath, do you know when people say, I don't care what people think? This phrase, you might have heard it before, I don't, have, I don't care what people think. Anyone who says that, that's other than a psychopath or a sociopath, is either swimming in the quicksand of self-delusion or that they're lying. Because we all care what other people think. We, and especially those who are closest to us. You cannot say, I don't care what other people think, unless you are a psychopath. If you are a psychopath or a sociopath, I agree that you might not care what people think. Because if you watch those interviews, it's, it's a kind of awkward stoicism that the, these people actually portray. They don't care. Just watch their reactions. I done that, and it's like a laugh. It's like someone dying, some kid dying, and stuff like. That. I was speaking to a psychopath one time, a self-admitted psychopath, and he. W I was talking to him about some massacres and something, and he started giggling and laughing. He does not care. <laughs> the guy does not care, and I realized that he doesn't care. And sometimes it can move on to sadism, like when you actually enjoy seeing people suffer. And psychopath, psychopathy, and sadism are connected, actually. So the the thing is. A lot of the, the Orientalist attack, or New Age, I would say, it's not even the Orientalist attack, because you don't find this level of argumentation, or this kind of, uh, I would call it a superficial level, actually, mm. if you think about it, of argumentation in the old books. But you find it now, like a lot of people say, well, he was a psychopath and he was a narcissist. This ayah shows you that he was, he was embarrassed, he was shy, he had these emotions. And we're going to come ac across when we speak about Maria Khibtiya, and we speak about the death of Ibrahim. How the Prophet was also in grief. He would, he would experience the full range of human emotion, of a natural human being, which makes his feats in life all the more impressive, actually. And the, the, when we read his seerah, it makes it even more impressive, because if it was a person that wasn't predisposed to this kind of pain, if he was a psychopathic individual, or whatever it may be, and you're saying he did this and he done that and he married this one and done that and he went to this war and all that kind of thing. It might not be as impressive. But the fact that this is a man 
who experiences the same range of human emotion that me and you and everyone else experiences, yet he proceeds with what he proceeded with, it makes it all the more impressive. But then the ayah continues. So what's the next part of the ayah? Okay, let's 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 come with this bit. Yeah. Yeah. What is this? Uh, what does this mean? First of all, translate that, please. Uh, my understanding is when Zaid divorced her and yes. uh, the Ida ended. Uh, finish, uh, okay, well, the Ida is not mentioned in the Quran, but it's, it's look. فلما قضى زيد منها وطرا زوجناكها. Let's stick with this for a second. It effectively means this. When Zaid done, he lost his uh, interest with her. Typically speaking, if you look at, for example, what Ibn Kathir says or anyone else like about this verse, when قَضَ حَاجَتُهُ For example, mm -hmm. literally when he's, when he's finished what he wanted to do with her. And I was doing tadabbur of this ayah, actually. And this might be wrong, and the Sheikh is here to correct me. Sheikh is here to correct me. But if you consider the reason why they got divorced, it's a bit of superiority, as we said, like she thought she was, you know. But see how Allah is putting it. So when Zaid had completed what he needed with her, he's putting her in the back foot, actually. Can you see what's happening? <coughs> so that Zaid is the one who's in the... Allah has... This, this is uh, a manifestation of the a hadith, of the hadith of the Prophet, من تواضع لله رفع الله. Yes. Because Zayd was mutawada in this situation, Zaynab was a little bit no. Mm -hmm. So, so how Allah dealt with both of them in the Quran is that, hey, look, when Zayd finished what he wanted to do with her, we got you married to her. Do you see what's happening here? It's not like when uh, when the marriage ended. It could, I mean, there could have been a range of different terminology, mm -hmm. but the terminology that was used, when Zayd finished what he wanted to do with her. Do you see what's happening here? Well, and if you think about what's going on in this ayah, Zaid, is, uh, Allah is putting him as the, okay, the one when Zaid decided that he didn't want to continue with it anymore. And with his name too. Hmm? And with his name too. Like, uh, yeah, he put his name there as well. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, yeah. And if you think about that, I mean, if, if you're just about to get married to a woman and you have all this desire for her and you love her so much and you had all this desire, the last thing you want to do is put her down. This is a little bit, a little bit like, okay, well, She'd be, read, she'd be listening to this. Imagine what she'd be thinking. Like, yeah, consider it. When, when Zayd decided to complete his job with her, finish what he wanted, oh, here it's translated as when Zayd no longer wanted her. Yeah, so, so there's, no more, there's no more desire, but it's yeah. about Zayd. Yeah. It's about Zayd. Yeah. It's not about her. Yeah, but the word actually mm. means haja. It means haja. Yeah. Yeah. It means like he's, he's, he's completed his desire with her. Yeah. Do you know how you mentioned how um, Zainab's the, the most righteous, religious out of all the wives? Mm. How, you know, obviously, uh, once the Quran was like fully revealed and everyone uh, kind of memorized and incorporated it, this is a question I had. What, how did Zainab interpret this ayat and the fact that. We don't know anything about that I, because you, we don't, I, don't, I have not come across a hadith from Zainab saying this is out of the other. In fact, what I did come across is she used it once again to show off about it. <laughs> it, oh, yeah, sorry to say, yeah, she said um, to the other wives, you, know, you guys got your, she's talking to the wives now. She goes, you guys got your wives, uh, your, your, yourselves married through, through your, for your yeah. families. Yeah. But I got married from seven <laughs> heavens. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, you can look at it like that. Uh, her tafsir of the ayah is, okay, well, Allah done the nikah from the wajnaka. So she's looking, she's holding on to what? The positive. The <laughs> She's not holding on to what? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but both are there. Yeah. So it's Allah his yani uh, from one perspective and he does that with the Sahabis. All, if you look at like Surah Al-Amran, you'd be surprised how Allah speaks sometimes with Sahabis. He puts them in his place. Because it's not just Zainab or whatever. He does that with, with the male Sahabis, especially when in war. He puts them in their place. And a lot of the time, he even, he goes far. They're close to Kufr that day than Iman. There's a lot of them, of the Sahaba, going on. But overall, because the Shias are listening to this, I'm going to cut it out. Yeah. <laughs> overall, yeah, Allah says, Radiallahu anhu, take the whole thing. Yeah. So with all their flaws, I mean, real love is, real love and real <coughs> acceptance is that we know what your flaws are and we still accept who you are and we still are happy with who you are. 
Because false thing is to try and create the Sahabis and the marriages and all that as some kind of an angelic union. It wasn't an angelic union. It was, and there was the divorce. And it's interesting to note that someone as high up as Ed ibn Haritha, in terms of the rank of Sahabis, got divorced. Moreover, Zainab bin Tajash, someone as high up as her, got divorced. But both of them were accepted by the community. After. So the, once again, the stigma of divorce, this could be used to show that, well, hold on, it's not that bad. It can't be that bad. It's other. So how much of a gap was there between the divorce and the marriage of the Prophet? Do we uh, know? That's a great question, but obviously there would have had to be idda. Okay. Yeah, so three, three months. menstruations or... This is mentioned through narration that mm. it happened immediately after it. Immediately, mm. yeah. Okay. This was an exception. So that was uh, one thing that I wanted uh, to mention. Now, uh, what's the ayah? How does it continue? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, as, uh, as the Sheikh is saying, I think you it is ahead, right? Yeah. 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 Okay. وكان الله وكان أمر الله مفعولا. Okay, so let's let's go with this because لكي usually is تعلي, right? So it's لكي is usually this is the reason. So that they may not be on the believers a difficulty if they want to marry the wives of their adopted sons. But obviously we know that adoption wasn't was terminated. So what this would mean is that the ones who you had previously had in an adopted format, because now adoption is not allowed, if uh, they have now removed them to like any, uh, they no longer want them. They, obviously you can't, Yani. So they no longer want them. But someone can re reply and say, well, hold on. What kind of a marriage is this anyway? Like on a sociological level, right? Let's say, for example, we were to reformulate what happened here. And we're talking about a man that had a guy that was almost like a son to him. And then he was married and then you have to marry them. This, the surah of the mas'ala, or this particular type of marriage, on a sociological level, wouldn't even represent 1% of all marriages that take place. Do you see what, what I'm saying here? So why is the Qur'an making a big deal about this? In fact, someone could say this is clearly used to cover up what the Prophet wanted in his shahwa and this and that. Can you see where they're coming in? That because this is such a is, is such a, a, a unlikely type of marriage. So the fact that this is mentioning as the reason yes, uh, doesn't seem like a good enough reason to go through all of this. So what would be the response to that? If the marriage wasn't for the reason for the marriage, but it was to end the, the adoption. So it's basically to say, nah, uh -huh. so at the end of it. You see, so now, now we're talking. Because now what you're saying is that really what was the bigger objective, which is one of the five major objectives of Sharia, is to end this adoption process or the adoption uh, thing. And the most emphatic way to do it, the most emphatic way to do it would be to bring the Prophet to marry that particular woman at that particular time because what that would do is it would leave no doubt in the minds of people that this cannot be his son. But the adoption issue was uh, rejected in another ayah. <laughs> yeah, that, that's I think before. This was the before that. Because the Zaid was <coughs> named Zaid ibn Muhammad. And then Prophet Sallallahu after that ayah, he renamed him back to Zaid ibn al-Harisa. So I think uh, in this ayah, there is different issues, not one about the marriage. No, but you see, let's, let's, let's stick with that for a second, right? Yeah. Because just because it was there in the fourth ayah, mm -hmm. it doesn't mean it was before in terms of like this was a, a ruling that took place a year before and then this happened yeah. after. This all happened at the same time. Mm -hmm. So this is sort of to reinforce. It's to reinforce the, private, uh, the yeah. prior rule, yeah. which is that, okay, so... Because if I just say theoretically, Adamli about him, right? You just call them to their fathers. Think of it practically. It wouldn't be as decisive. So what does that mean? The shubha. There's, uh, there'll be different fuqaha coming in and saying it means it means it's preferred. Al istihbab. Well, no, seriously, because yeah. there's a whole discussion about al amr. Hal al amr yufid al istihbab or wajub and this and that. there'll be a group of scholars that come out and say that you can still do tabanni, yeah. but it's mustahab not to. Right? Trust me. But this issue, <laughs> this issue that came, uh, he's married. Uh, there's no way there's tabanni. 
no way there's adoption because he's married this woman here. So yeah. what this does is because why is it a big deal? It's a big deal because Islam came to protect the lineages of people. That is one of the five objectives of the Sharia. And if people, if I was calling another man, my dad, like nowadays, especially in the age of globalization, with stepdads, the, the matter would be finished. Bro, you know what? He got step. He's my stepdad. No, he's my dad. We can call him sir. And I don't have uh, runaway fathers. None of none of the people whose runaway fathers, or a lot, a chunk of people, especially in the Muslim community, whose runaway fathers have run away. The 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 young the youngster will now associate more with the stepfather. They say, "This is my dad." Mm. But the fact that Islam prohibits that allows this person. Okay, this is not my father biologically. But he's, he's like my father in terms of he raised me, blah, blah, blah. They can make those distinctions. It's very important. That, so instead of, okay, well, someone comes and say, well, this sociologically only deals with 1% of marriages, not even 1% of marriages, 0.1% of marriages. So it doesn't make sense for the Quran to make a big deal out of it. The response is, actually, it makes a big deal out of it. The Quran makes a big deal out of it because of the implication of one of the five object, overarching objectives that Islam came to protect. One of them being lineages, because if it doesn't protect that, then we have chaos in terms of knowing uh, where our fathers came from and stuff like that go ahead just out of reference uh, i think you might have mentioned it in your londonia series but what are the other five of uh, the other four so the other like so the other wealth so, right yeah so yeah. the uh, uh, wealth so for, let's start with the nafs yeah. deen actually number one religion Nathan. the number one is uh, religion then deen then uh, uh, sorry deen then nafs which is the person like the life then number three is mel Okay, I mean, it's not in any particular order. I mean, you've got Aql there as well, right? Which is the rationality of the person. And also, um, you have this, which is Nesab. Some out of six, I can't remember what the sixth is that they add. Sometimes they uh, mention Ard or Nesab. Oh, I see. So, the focus on what... Ard is like the, the honor of the person. Yeah. yeah, so because it links to the lineage. So they add two of them. Is that your no, no, oh. it links to lineage. So, mm. some will say lineage... And some yeah. will say earth. Some will count oh, it in the lineage, some will count it different. Yeah, for example, yeah, why yeah. Allah Azzawajal made it for his, uh, adultery, for example? Mm. Is it a matter related to the honor of the person or yeah. the lineage? No, no, it's good. The lineage. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so you, you well, notice scholars. As well. Wealth, yeah. malice. Malice, yeah, yeah. Malice, okay. So that's like wealth which includes <laughs> property. For the sake of religion. Sure. Uh, the the question might be so okay Zayd ibn Haritha uh, he was killed uh, like uh, later on uh, in the battle of uh, Tabuk right okay so why when did Mu'ta ah Mu'ta Mu'ta right yeah so the question is uh, why won't Allah marry Zainab after this so that uh, there is no uh, controversy around around this. So, 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 if you argue mm -hmm. that uh, uh, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala wanted uh, to show that uh, okay, there is uh, there is no uh, differences of interpretations uh, of uh, uh, of um, adoption, uh, so uh, another person could say, okay, then why don't uh, uh, he married her after? Because Allah knows everything, right? So why don't he marry her after? The, it wouldn't the, be as emphatic. The, the, because then, then you'd have a, another group of scholars saying, uh, alive, you're not allowed to. yeah, so long as they're alive and so if you're not allowed to. And so it's just like about death and life. This makes it very clear. The hukum is even more clear like this. Mm. The fact okay. that, and you know what? It's very interesting you ask that question. One of the narrations I came across was that, guess who engaged the Prophet to uh, Zainab bin Tajash? It was Zayd ibn Haratha him, himself. Mm. And in fact, so if you look at some of the shuruhat of why he done that, they say he done that to uh, do qata of the elsinah of the nas to make it even more emphatic that he was okay with this. If, if for example, it happened after his death, it's like we wouldn't know. What would Zayd say about this? Hmm. Yeah. Or maybe he didn't like that. How can he do that to Zayd? But the fact that he was okay with it, and he, you could see visibly that he was okay with it, it even made it stronger. He had enough of that particular relationship. <laughs> no, honestly, he had enough. And this shows you, you have two people at the highest caliber, okay, but they just don't get along. I think the issue he's referring to, I think uh, there's another issue. The life of the Prophet ﷺ is exemplary. Mm. So every incident has a uh, mean or... Has. The same incident happened with Umm Salama. While she migrated to Abyssinia yeah. and her husband died there. 
So there, she was desperate. She had no, no one. Then the Prophet ﷺ offered the marriage, and he, uh, he off uh, she, he married her. The same happened with uh, let's say in this example, as you said, there is an example of uh, saving the lineage, nasab, everything. So th it shows that the Prophet ﷺ had let's say eleven wives. Everyone had a hikmah behind it. Especially, for example, let's say if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala want the Prophet ﷺ to marry Zainab, who the Prophet is to reject it. So only did the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided him to marry marry her. So it means yeah. there is a hikmah behind Absolutely. every incident in life of the Prophet. Yeah, that's a very good point. And it's, it's interesting you mentioned uh, Umm Salma because if you look at each marriage of the Prophet ﷺ, you can see the hikmah, as you mentioned. So for example, with Umm Salma, she was a widow. Mm. Okay, as you mentioned, like her, her husband... Abu Salama, okay, as you know, you know, we haven't covered this and we won't cover Umm Salama in great detail because there's not that many controversies that surround her. In yeah. fact, she's one of the least controversial because of what, what she represented and what she was was that uh, we kind of maybe alluded to it, but her husband uh, died and then the Prophet married her. So she's a widow, you see. It's kind of like uh, Sodom and Zama'a we spoke about before. She was also in Abyssinia and she was with the uh, Mushrikun. So you had an older woman here who had kids of her, in her own in her own right? The Prophet ﷺ married her. You had a woman who's a widow. The Prophet ﷺ married her to to incentivize the believers that it's okay, it's good, it's a good thing. And there's many narrations to marry a widow, for example. And then you had um, Umm Habiba as well, who was the daughter of Abu Sufyan. Umm Habiba, which we're not going to cover in detail, but you can see what's going on here. Which was, it was a marriage to try and bring the hearts of the opponents closer. Aisha radiallahu anha, she was young, she was dedicated to the knowledge. Exactly. Because she uh, narrated more than 3,000 hadith. Yes, mm -hmm. yes she so did. So everything has a hikmah behind the marriage. In absolutely, fantastic mm -hmm. point. So yeah, absolutely. So you can see, when you look at now, when we've looked at Zainab bin Tajash in the, in the lens of, okay, uh, we, yani, this, this, this is what it's done in terms of ahkam. Mm. This is what it's done in terms of objective sharia. You can see really the thamara or the fruit of the hikmah of, the, uh, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala number one number two number two you can see in terms of preservation of the religion of Islam how it's done that because Zainab bin Tajash the marriage of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa let me tell you this let me tell you this the marriage of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa to Zainab bin Tajash would be considered by modern historians to be one of the most authenticating incidents in the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa they would, and many of them, I can tell you that for a fact, would consider this to be more voracious than the hadith sciences. Now, that's wrong. And we can explain in some other times why that's wrong. But the fact that the, the marriage of Zainab and the Jash, because of the principle of embarrassment, which is one of the main principles, especially in like medieval historical uh, kind of exercises, is fully fulfilled with the testimonies of the Prophet's wife and others in the exegesis that we find that the principle of embarrassment in the life or the marriage of Zainab bin Tajash in particular meets the criteria. So subhanAllah, one of the great wisdoms that we can, using our criticality, discover and uncover about the marriage of the Prophet to Zainab bin Tajash is that it triangulates the pr preservation making mechanisms of the seerah and the sunnah in a way which complies, which satisfies different levels of historical authentication. Can you see? So we, number one, we said, look at, look at the wisdom. Number one, we said, the objects of Sharia and the Nasab. Number two, we said, it shows you the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu engagement with people and his, his own vulnerability and human nature. That it showed that the human, that prophet, the human side of the Prophet, the vulnerability of the embarrassment, the shyness, the modesty of the Prophet. And number three, we've shown how this, in fact, this marriage, it preserves the sunnah in a way which satisfies a whole different criterion, which is more applicable to the historical critical method of modern times. That's what it's done. And it, by the way, you'll find this mentioned by the enemies of Islam. They always mention Zainab. They say it, it, it satisfies... Yeah, yeah, a lot, a lot. Uh, yeah, yeah, he does actually. That's a good point. John of Damascus mentioned that, you know, a lot of people do mention it from, from John of Damascus all the way up to 
critical scholars of... I'm not going to mention their names because I don't want to give them too much credit. <laughs> but of, of today, they mention it in their books, in their peer-reviewed journals. So it brings a whole new audience to Islam, by the way, which is like the elites of the Western world itself who are actually this... Pe believe me, they, they, they express... Um, they express a kind of uh, fascination or interest with this. And for them, it does satisfy their critical or their criticality, their historical criticality. So that's number one. Now, we're going to go on to the next. Any questions, Igor? Yeah, yeah. I have uh, a uh, question regarding uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, hiding wahi. If we took uh, that interpretation of an ayah, what took fi fi nafsik? Yeah, fi nafsik. Uh, how is it possible that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, could uh, hide uh, something from the wahi of Allah subhanahu ta'ala if Allah has already told him and this is wahi and he knew about this how he because there's two kinds of wahi the wahi that Allah tells the Prophet to say so for example the Quran the Quran is, is known that he ha Allah, the Prophet Allah has to go out and say it, yeah and there's wahi for example it could be a dream it could be this it could be that which the Prophet Allah might not know okay I have to reveal this to the people and this kind of wahid is in the second category because it's a personal matter. So, so it could be that the Prophet ﷺ thought, okay, this is, this is not to be said to the public. But what Allah is trying to reinforce is that even on personal matters, you have to go and tell that to the public. Do you see what I'm saying? So there was some level of ambiguity whether is this applicable, is it appropriate for a public audience? That if there was any hesitation, Allah pushes him and says it is actually. And it's almost as if Allah is reprimanding him for even ha having hesitation on the matter. I know it's public, but you have to say it, this. Do you see the point? Because there was ambiguity whether this should be publicized or not. Yeah. Uh, I have two uh, points here. The first uh, one is uh, when uh, Sheikh Lajari said about uh, 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 Rasul uh, married uh, 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 what's the wife's name? Uh, Bint Haitha? Uh, Zainab. Zainab. Zainab bin Jahsh. He married after the Idda, right? Uh, because some people here understood it like, uh, no, it's uh, there, there was an exception. So, it, uh, oh no, no, it was after the Idda. Yeah. It was after that. Yeah. yeah, after that. Okay. The second one is um, uh, one reply also to the situation, the the, the argument of that uh, why Rasul Sam didn't marry her after uh, the Zayn uh, Hajj die in mm. in the Vazud Muta. Mm. I, I just thought about it now when, when you said it's, he died in Mu'ta, not in Tabuk. Mm -hmm. uh, because the battle of Mu'ta especially, it was a um, very hard battle. Like It, it wasn't uh, uh, balanced between uh, Muslims and uh, Kafirs, mm -hmm. so uh, disbelievers. Uh, and uh, might someone might just, uh, a disbeliever might say, he sent him to the death or something like this. So uh, uh, okay. making, it, making it happen. <laughs> yes, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. Making it happen that's while he's alive, it was, it was <laughs> he's li alive, it's I like very that, strong. Allah. That's a very good point, yeah. He sent him to a, a fight that he could, so he could take his wife. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. They, could, they would say that. Yeah, follow. You see how you're talking about how, like, why would Allah make a big deal out of this if it's a small percentage of marriages. Mm. Isn't it also important to mention that it was frowned upon amongst Quraysh and they, they were like sort of making fun saying, how could you marry your son's That's a very wife? good point. Yeah, so this That's is another this is another angle thing. of it, which is that actually Allah is protecting the honor of the Prophet. So he's, he's trying to say that this is not a, a problem. You know, and so, and it's not just about the Prophet. So it's, it's like actually this is ease for everybody. It's good. Okay. One of the things yep. I, I wanted to mention is yep. um, sort of this being the most controversial marriage kind of proves the Aisha radhalayallahu anha being nine is not an issue. That's a good point. Yeah, so this even helps answer that question. Look, if yes, you right. really want to get controversial, you should focus on that because that's yeah. what the Arabs at the time argued about, not this. Absolutely. That's a really good point. Excellent point. Okay, um, now we're going to move on to uh, another wife. And Shaka, you're going to help us with this one. It's uh, Juwariya bint al Harith. So I've been speaking a lot today, and I'm going to try and incorporate this a lot more. People presenting, you know, that. Uh, Go on, I've got about 15 minutes here. Yeah. Okay, yeah, take your time and ask us questions. 
Do you want to come here? No, I, when I was saying, I mean like, as in I need to take a call in 15 minutes. Okay, so. that's fine. No, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm probably going to talk like this here. Yeah. No, um, <clears throat> Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. So, <clears throat> um, so we're speaking at the moment about the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and uh, one of the wives that we need to consider and around whom there is some discussion is uh, Jawadiyah radiallahu ta'ala anha. Um, the story of the, her marriage to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, goes as follows, and this is a, only a summary, that um, the Prophet Sallallahu received some news that um, the Banu Mustaliq wanted to attack the Muslims. This is the tribe that she was from. And the head of this tribe is a man called Al Harith, who was Jawadiyah's father. So the Prophet ﷺ, uh, left Medina with a group of Muslims and went in the direction of Banu Mustaliq to uh, to fight them. And uh, they met at a like a I think like a water well that they had called the Muraisiyah. Um And there was a skirmish, and the ten of the Banu Mustaliq were killed. Um, and one of those that was killed was Jawadiyah's father, Al Harith, and the rest of them were taken as uh, captives of war. Um, what happened thereafter is uh, that a companion of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Thabit Adun Thabit Ibn Qais Thabit Ibn Qais Radiallahu Anhu He was the Sahabi that took Jawariya uh, as a uh, captive of war um, Obviously she was the kind of like the Sayyid of her qawm She's the daughter of the, the leader So uh, she begins to have a discussion with uh, Thabit radiallahu anhu about what type of arrangement might she be able to do. So she agrees on like a mukhatiba arrangement. I think this has been discussed in a... Uh, Quickly explain what that is. In the, yeah, I think this was discussed in some of the, the sessions that we had on um, kind of like prisoners of war and the like. But the idea is basically that um, Allah says in the Quran that... Um, that this, this idea of mukatiba that a prisoner of war can make an agreement um, with basically their captor that uh, they will pay a certain amount of money in order to kind of purchase their freedom. So she agreed a certain amount with uh, Thabit ibn Qais, radiallahu anhu, um, but she didn't have the money for it at the, at the time. So she went to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and uh, as she enters, uh, she accepts Islam. She says she takes a testimony of faith. She accepts Islam, and she asks the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to help her out in terms of uh, you know this mukatiba arrangement. So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that you know uh, would you rather something better than that? And so then she said what? And then he said that uh, that I will marry you. And so then she accepted that. Okay, let's pause here for a second because I like the fact that. There's two things here. Mm. Very, very direct proposal by the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Yes. Which shows you the way the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam approached women for marriage. Mm. In, the, in the modern age, this is something, a question people don't uh, maybe tackle and deal with vis-a-vis -vis the seerah. This is uh, very direct. direct yeah. Very direct. It's no, no uh, sorry to say, uh, you know, yeah, what they call it. No, no, what, they, what is the, 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 the red current red pill uh, and all this. They say you have to do. What do they call game it? Game like? and this and that. Mm. You have to have game and you have to do chirping and this and that. Sorry, and <laughs> let me get your number and this and all this and let's have a discussion. Let's go there. Let's have a no straight away. You see this? Mm. It's cutthroat. It's like you know, you get a knife, a hot knife, and you cut it through the butter mm. of the marriage process and just get straight to the point. Mm. But also, what did he give her? And it starts with C. Choices. A choice. He didn't say, well, you mm. know, I'm going to buy you from Thabit ibn Qais. Because he could have. Mm. I will pay for you. Now I'll pay for it. And you can, the, 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 the Mukataba arrangement will what? Will continue with me. Mm. <laughs> now, honestly, it could have been. She's a slave. It, mm. it could have been a better option if somebody is rejecting it. No, because think about it. Think about it. For, for, just think about it for a second, right? There's no threat of rejection in that situation. Say, look, I've already spoken to Thabit. <laughs> no, that's what I say. I've already spoken to him. And I've already arranged that I'm going to reduce the price and take, um, it's going to be me this, rather than him. Do you see what's happening here? Is that not a thing? Of course it can be. So I've arranged it with Thabit and I've, I've decided to take you as a prisoner of war. Yes. And uh, you're going to be doing the ransom to me instead of him. And even uh, it's not compulsory to do the ransom. Like It's not compulsory. There's no ransom. Yeah. <laughs> In fact, it's not, forget about all that. And there's a difference of opinion. I mean, the majority of full methods say it's, it's, it's not compulsory. But there's some, like Qurtubi mentions that some, some say it's compulsory with the Salaf and so on. But let's just for the sake of argument. 
That could have been the case. But he put himself in a, in, in a vulnerable position. Yeah, the Prophet yeah, And by the way, you'll find in the seerah, and you'll find in the sunnah, both things happening. Women would come to the Prophet and ask him if they want to marry him. And he would also ask women. So it would be reciprocal. Like for example, there's a very famous hadith in Bukhari, where, where a woman came to the Prophet and she said, Do you need anything with me? <laughs> she literally came to the Prophet and she said, Do you have any need for me? That's what she said. He looked at her and then he said, Silent. Because he didn't want to hurt her feelings, you know. He didn't want to marry her. Okay. Now I was saying to the guys the other day, I'm subhanAllah, it's been a long time since someone came to me and said, Halaka bi hajja. You know, it's been a long time. Ali Dawah, me and discussing this issue. Yeah, I don't. Uh, yeah, with well, you, maybe not, but it might be a different story with me. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing is interesting, maybe Sheikh can touch upon it. Yeah. Isn't the Prophet actually honoring them by saying marriage? Because if they were um, hmm. concubines, the right for the uh, concubine is different for the one. Because if you think about it, by marriage, yeah. he's actually honoring them by saying Absolutely. there's responsibilities now. Because as a concubine, yeah. you don't really. Have that, no, Sheikh? It's a good point. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So, uh, can you continue with it? Because I don't want to break your flow. I think we did a little bit, but... No, but continue. I think you, you kind of preempted a lot of the, let's say, um, sure. issues that people raise with this. So, um, I'll, I'll finish the story and then I'll sure. kind of speak Please about tell some us. of these yes. objections. Can so, also talk about the choice? What was the choice? Just so yeah, yeah, tell him again. So, so what did so he... So it was marry me or... Yeah. So, can we turn back so she asked basically for some assistance in sorting out this mukatab arrangement. She had agreed to basically pay a sum of money that she didn't have. So the Prophet ﷺ said to her that, I, you know, can I offer you something better than this? And so she said, what? And then he said that I will marry you. And that, that, uh, that, uh, that basically that wealth will be taken care of, the, the whole mukatab arrangement, and I will marry you. So she accepted that arrangement, radiallahu yeah. anha. Thereafter, um, all of the sahaba now realize that basically the captives that they had were now that basically the in-laws of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. See, it's a tribal arrangement. So she's related to all of the captives that they've just taken from the Banu Mustalik. So they all decided that, you know, we can't keep the in-laws of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as uh, captives. So they all decided to free uh, all of the captives that they had taken. And so it was said that, um, you know, that there's no woman who's, who's brought more barakah to her people than Joyria did for her people. So to explain Radulah that bit one more time, because someone's say, explain the bit about all this free slaves. What happened exactly? When the Prophet Sallallahu married Joyria, yeah. anha, all of the Sahaba who had received captives from this particular battle, yes. they began to kind of say amongst themselves, that kind of like, how can we keep uh, captives who are in-laws of the Prophet Sallallahu Mm. Because Jawaira radiallahu anha, of course, she's related to all of the people from the Banu Mustaliq. It's mm. a tribal arrangement. Mm -hmm. So they all decided, yani, they didn't want to keep captives who were in laws of the Prophet. Yeah. So they decided to free all of them. So, how, so we're talking about one marriage yes. caused the freeing of 10 dozens of slaves. Yeah, I've heard it mentioned, and the Sheikh and double check that it was 100 families that were taken. Uh, is that's what's mentioned, yeah? So 100 yeah, families. We mentioned the Lihar because we mentioned that he was killed. Yes. But he wasn't killed. Was it killed? Yeah, and he came back later to the Prophet and announced Islam. It's mentioned here in the couple of books, yeah. I saw that he was killed a lot. Well, how are you? Different opinions. Yeah, different opinions. Maybe. Okay, but in any. Khaybar. Yeah, 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 Khaybar. Uh, that Al Harith came to the Rasulullah, but That's I'm not right. sure whether or not it's an authentic narration, even on the standards of Sirah. Mm. So he mentioned that when he came, my daughter will never be a slave for a person or so. Mm. So the Rasulullah proposed Lil Harith mm -hmm. if I would offer to marry her. Mm. Uh, so he mentioned, let's give her the choice. Then the father actually told his daughter, La Tafdahina, don't. What to don't uh, embarrass us, humiliate us, humiliate us. Humiliate humiliate us. us, and he meant don't marry him, mm -hmm. not the other. Yani, mm. yani, how, how dare you marry the person who defeated yeah. us in battle? Mm. So, so she uh, chose mm. to marry him. So, there are a couple of relations that show that he was alive, he was alive yeah. and he he became a Muslim. Mm. So, so uh, the question now would be I mean, remember the, the question that we posed last week with uh, Safiya bin Tuhay. What was the question? What kind of psychological thing that is attributed to women that marry? Oh, uh, the Stockholm Stockholm. Okay, so someone will come and say what, uh, Shakir? What would someone come and say? 
Yeah, so somebody would say that yani, the idea that you can wage, you can basically go to battle with somebody's family, defeat them in battle, and then marry that person and they're actually happy to be in that marriage is, is an impossibility. And therefore, everything which would seem to indicate that Jawadiyah was happy with that marriage, we will interpret it as being some type of psychological condition mm. where she was, you know, now predisposed to have positive reflections. And now, especially, thank you very much for that. I mean, responding to that with the information that you have from last week, how would you respond? Do you remember the slides? We have, a, I mean, we've spoken about Stockholm Syndrome vis-a-vis -vis uh, Sophia bin Tuhaye. So what would be the things that, what kind of things did we cover last week? What's the first thing about Stockholm Syndrome? It's very difficult. What is it? What is it? Uh, it's the idea that um, the prisoner uh, falls in love, falls in love with the idea with the person of the, you know, the guy who's uh, taking the captor. Yeah. Okay. So, so qu first question I have for you then, right? If that's the case, if that's what the Stockholm Syndrome is. Is it a kind of insanity? Um, is it a kind of insanity? Is it a kind of psychosis? Yes. No. no I think it was mentioned that no. uh, if somebody has that diseases, so he can decide or he, he okay, can now, be yeah, affected yes. with it. Excellent. That. So go back to you now. Is Stockholm Syndrome, is, are one of the uh, symptoms of it psy uh, psychosis? No. No, from that no. definition. Okay, so what does that mean? What's the implication of that? It means that they, they have a choice. They're, they're making a choice. They can, they can take decisions. So anything that you psychosis or this, that is an assertion. It's Beautiful, an excellent. So this is an excellent point, right? Yeah. So according to the DSM register and stuff, or whatever you like, any definition you want, psychosis is when you lose touch with what? Reality. Reality. And if you don't have psychosis, and if you're not insane, and if you're not in a coma, and your mind is not vegetated somehow, mm -hmm. then legally in any framework, legally, would you be allowed to make your own decisions? Yes. Can someone suspend your right to make decisions no. based on the fact that they think that you have Stockholm Syndrome? No. No. So even if you did have Stockholm Syndrome, it doesn't mean anything by way of decision making. Your decision making is not suspended. Yeah. So, and that's according to every Western country. I don't know of anyone that says if someone has Stockholm Syndrome, Mm. that they have psychosis and therefore they shouldn't be making their own decisions. Yeah, that that the father's going to come and start writing a will mm. on the behalf of that person or the, that they need a responsible adult or whatever it may be. Yeah, I think rather it should open the dialogue on the psychology of a woman of what trigger mechanisms does she have in her biology that makes point. her fall in love. So there's something deeper, like I said, to the hard wiring. What is it that in her she has? And this, you see this many times. Like You know there was on Netflix, there was a um, documentary about, you know that guy who was accused of... Um, Committing a murder, he came out. He did sent sentence. Oh, I don't know if you guys, guys stop acting like I'm the only one watching this. Which one is it called? Uh, <laughs> Let's make uh, this clear. Uh, Everyone looking at me like they don't watch it. It's, um, of murder, what's it called? Murder. Yes, um, um, it's called uh, something murder, man. Something murder. Yes. Yes. yes so right. basically, very, very. If you haven't, bro, I mean, you have to. It's 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 one of the most yeah, yeah like, impressive. I watched documentary. It's a documentary actually. Really? Yeah. yeah. Really? It's, yeah, bro, it's, it's, it's like it's, a documentary, bro. Bro, there was it was phenomenal. But they they were women actually writing letters to him. Like, yeah, I'm in love with you. Never met oh, him. Oh, Ted Bundy. No, 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 no. It's, uh, it's, it's well, something murder. Reinventing a murder? Or no, 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 something, something murder, yeah. yeah. You need to watch it, bro. And there were women, no, like, yes. basically writing letters. Like, I mean, if you look at him, he's not really... Uh, How to get away with murder. He's not really a... Uh, <laughs> something like that. Yeah, he's not really an attractive no, man. Either. Yeah, and if you look at him, he's not really that. an attractive man. But there were women basically visiting him in prison. Around exactly. the world. In Europe, they would travel to America and say, I'm in love with you, yeah? So you, are, you, don't, you never met him. What is it that's attracting you to this guy? And then it goes, it shows there's, there was a search done on a woman's psychology. Uh, so there was five kind of fantasies that a woman has, yeah? Is uh, they're in love, like, is a vampire? I can't find uh, that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Making a murderer. A billionaire. Called making a murderer, bro. Making a murderer. Making a murderer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it just tells you that there is things about a woman that we haven't discovered. <coughs> you know, so, yeah, I think, I think it just opens the question of, it's totally acceptable that, and it's shown, there's books written on this. I like what you're saying right there's now. Books I think it's a very yeah. clever way. It just shows our ignorance exactly. to how a woman is wired. And you'll see it. Yeah, we just need to discover it. The yeah. pragmatic nature yeah. of how women in the medieval period. And today. Were, and, to, and today, and but today. maybe to a lesser extent. Because the thing is, today, you don't find entire villages being wiped out and then, you know, the same mechanism. But it still happens. Like, you'll see, and we've, we spoke about this at length, actually, uh, on your shows no, and stuff. Now, now the world is a global village. Yeah. So sure. now you have individuals who have this charisma, whatever you want to call it, and you've yeah. got women around the world on the internet storming to them. No, no, I, I get what you mean. Yeah, it's uh, happening on a mass scale now. It's, it's definitely happening. But in terms of like this um, ability to adapt, yeah. 
because you know imagine an entire village has been wiped out now you have to adapt it's like it makes a lot of sense for a woman to have a more malleable ability to do that in the in that in that space of time but yeah sure i mean i i like uh all of this, go ahead. So, so one more point was uh, the view they have of the Prophet from Sassan with his wives and the Sahaba is such a weird view where he's abusive, he's controlling. Where would they be without him? Like, yeah, yeah. would we know the Arabian Peninsula if the Prophet from mm. didn't come there? Would mm. the Umm al Mu'mineen be more, uh, one of the most yeah, influential people without the Prophet And Jawairiyah, absolutely, I agree with that. Yeah, I mean, do you know this? Um, Jawairiyah was a good worship, she was an excellent worshiper, she's shown all the signs of, um, of that. I mean, there's a hadith in uh, Sahih Muslim. <coughs> Where she was, you know, worshiping for a very long time, and the Prophet ﷺ saw her like in constant worship, which shows you how uh, dedicated she was to the cause. And then he told her, like, you know, there's there's four words that you could say that are better than all that you've done. Subhanallah, he will be hamdi ala the khalqi wa lidha nafsi wa zina ta'arshi wa madhi kalimati. And this is wa uh, madhi kalimati, and this is mentioned in all of the athkar sabah and masa. I'm not sure if you've come across, but that hadith is. Jawariya bin al Harith hadith. The point is that they see it as abuse, but I was saying from a Western paradigm, they are the most influential women of the world because he married them. Exactly. But like it's not an abuse. He actually Allah, the, he yeah, raised and, their. And not ranking. only that, but he gave them. Remember, we we'll go back to last week's session because there's two things he does. Number one, he gave her a choice before the marriage, and what did he do after as well during the marriage? Gave all these websites. Gave, gave them a choice again. Yeah. Remember, we said in al Hayat al Dunya wa Same surah, surah al Ahzab. Which is that he gave, so he gave them a choice before the marriage and gave them a choice during the marriage. So there's, there's no question that Stockholm Syndrome would indicate that there's a continual entrapment. But there is no continual entrapment. So, so we're, we're using this as argumentum ad absurdum. We're saying even if you're saying that she's suffering from this thing called Stockholm Syndrome, it wouldn't mean anything vis-a-vis -vis like how, her decision-making ability from a legal Western paradigm. But if we don't say that, then... Um, you go ask yourself, how could she have Stockholm Syndrome? And she had all these, like Sophia had the ability to go to her family, Jawadiya had the ability not to, and so on as well. Uh, regarding the documentary mentioned and uh, that uh, uh, this uh, syndrome that might be attached to how women think or something like that, I would like to put it more toward uh, the morality of Islam and how that can, uh, can affect people uh, to be uh, to choose uh, uh, who, cap who the captor. Because the moral, the moral thing, the, the moral like uh, evidence they see. Uh, an example of this we just spoke about is Zaid bin Haritha. Mm -hmm. When uh, his father came uh, and his uncle came to Rasulullah and asked uh, him to, uh, to buy him. And Rasul uh, gave him the choice either uh, if he chooses you, he just go with you for free. Yes. And uh, if he's not, then I, I want to. So uh, what, you're, what you're showing here is that there's a, there's a theme. Throughout yeah. the Prophet's life is that he doesn't force people to be in his life. He doesn't whether force it's with people. Zaid, whether it's with Safiya, whether it's with Jawairiya. And, and it's not only women, it's like the morals of Islam also and uh, the morals of Rasulullah his characteristic, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, it shows something uh, distinguished about Rasulullah And yes. um, yeah, uh, second point also about uh, uh, when you, when you uh, mentioned. Um, uh, when you mentioned about um, that, uh, what's the name of Joyria? That Joyria, uh, uh, um, it's written that she has the honor of uh, enslave all of her, all, all of her tribes. Yep. So this is also was one of the things that uh, show the morality of Islam. Uh, I think that is very good point. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to like add on to that uh, it's a good way to sort of end a confrontation it's a form of unification really absolutely uh because like, a really good point what do how would they want to end it like yeah extermination no it's it's a way of inviting them in absolutely. and it actually builds a sustainable society like there are countries in the arab world that were created through marriage in a way like they would go in and then and, and this is well known i mean even yeah. now in popular culture we see this Absolutely. happening in like medieval england and medieval france yeah, and medieval yeah. italy and they, they all knew it this is a good way of doing it right? absolutely yeah. yeah excellent so um let me ask you a question um we've, we've spoken about who the wives of the prophets are what are the names of uh, the slaves the female slaves of the prophet maria okay well maria al will come to her and then she became um -walad. So she was raised in that. We'll, we'll speak about it. No, because she became a wife. Mm -hmm. 
How many? Is only like two. Is only like two or three? How Pardon? Many? Well, that's what I'm asking you. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> This is your lane. Okay, because yeah, but we all know the names of the. Well, these are the female slaves. So, um, okay, we have. Uh, let me tell you the answer. According to Ibn Qayyim, okay, he mentions that there's a person called Abu Abaydah, and it's not the one that we were thinking about here. <laughs> but he mentions that there were four. Okay, so we have Maria Al-Qibtiya, we have Raihana, which we're going to speak about a little bit, but uh, there's a difference of opinion whether she was a wife or not. And there's even different opinion whether Maria was a wife or not, but the majority opinion is that she was Umm Walad and so on. And then there are two others actually that he mentions. One of them is called Jamila. We don't know much about her. And I don't know of any narration, like authentic narration, which talks about her. And the, a very interesting, listen to this one, right? Ibn al-Qayyim mentions there's a fourth one who was gifted by guess who? Zainab bin Tajash. <laughs> Zainab bin Tajash, according to Ibn Qayyim al gave the Prophet a wife, uh, a slave woman. Uh, interesting uh, thing to do. Uh, if that is true, I haven't come across any authentic narration that says that. This but is this after is. The marriage. Pardon? Well, yeah, yeah, it would make sense. Yeah. But I was going to say that there is a hadith in Bukhari, which I came across as well. And this hadith in Bukhari uh, indicates that the Prophet ﷺ died and he didn't have any slaves. So either the slaves were raised in rank or they were freed. Because that narration wouldn't make sense. Zaid was also a slave the first time and then he was gifted by Yeah. No, uh, we're talking Khadija. about female, female slaves only, yeah. But, uh, you mentioned... <laughs> Did I say only slaves? Yeah. Did I mention, Did I mention slave, yeah. gender? Oh, sure. There's a, a men, man mentioned. The first one you mentioned. Which one? Maria, Raihana, no, no. Jamila and... Uh, Abu Abayd or something? No, he, that he mentions this. Okay, okay. So he's the narrator of that. <laughs> okay, so um, now let's, let's move on to one of them, in fact which is the most, the one that we have the most information about, which is Maria al qibtiya uh, Who knows the story of Maria al qibtiya What happened with her? So, you know, okay. Maria al qibtiya hmm? She was one of two slave women that were gifted by the... What was the other one called, you know? Uh, I forgot. But he gave her to... Um, he gave her to the poet, what's his name? The poet of the Sahaba. Hassan. Hassan, yeah, Hassan. Um, and it was the Egyptian. I don't know what the leader of the Mokaukis. Mokaukis. Yeah. Okay. So basically, what this is, I tried to letter. find this story in any authentic narration. I couldn't find it in the authentic narrations, like in the full story. But I've, uh, it's mentioned by the and others, even mentioned by Ibn Qayyim. That the story goes as follows: basically, that sh uh, the Sira writers say that she became a Muslim at the hands of Hatib. Ibn Abi Balta, this person who was had an ambassadorial role of Dawah, actually. Hatib Ibn Abi Balta. You might know him from the story of uh, many his controversy where he went uh, after Hudaybiyah, went to his family and he told them, he warned them yeah. about the conquest of Mecca cause, and then that led to problems. But Hatib Ibn Abi Balta uh, basically went to Maria al Qibtiya. And they say this happened after Hudaybiyah. Okay, that's what this narration is saying. Because the Prophet ﷺ, after Hudaybiyah, he sent the letters to the kings of the earth. Yes. So, Persia, the Romans, the Muqawqis. So he sent Hatim Balta holding the letter of the Prophet ﷺ to the Muqawqis. Hmm. So it makes sense that he met Maria Al-Qibtiyah. She became Muslim. Yes, so, so they, the narration, Sheikh, and you can correct me, mm -hmm. is that he, he sent Hatim ibn Mabalta ta to uh, that particular region and that he done dawah to her and she became Muslim before she even came to Medina. This is what I, this is what I came across. <coughs> that she, she, she became Muslim before she even came to Al Medina. And actually, this Makaukis is from Alexandria. So these people are known for generosity in the past and the present. <laughs> <laughs> um, and his uh, his the sister that she was, was there. Seven. Seven? She uh, was slave. a slave, yeah. She was a slave. Yeah, she, she, was. She, was. So she was gifted to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Buying and because selling a human know, being. You can't be a servant. The kings had that different reactions. Mm. Yeah. So and the, and her sister was called Serene, by the way. Yeah, Serene. Uh, uh, Serene was the name of the sister. And the guy, because of how generous he was, Muqawqis, he also sent 7,000 mithqals of dhahab, of gold. You know. Anyway, <laughs> we got, hopefully he became Muslim, I don't know. But he definitely didn't rip up the paper. 
Um, and what happened after that was that, uh, so she became Muslim. The, the key story that happens with her, that we are acquainted with in, the, in, in Bukhari, in fact, in the Sunnah, is that she actually was the mother of the child of the Prophet Sallam, Ibrahim. Ibrahim, he was beloved to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he died at the age of one and a half. And when he died, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there's a very famous hadith of the Prophet saying that, that certainly the heart is in pain, is grieving. Um, let me get the exact... Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yahzan. Uh, uh, that, uh, that certainly the heart is in pain and the eyes are crying. But we won't say that except which... Allah is pleased with or that the Lord is pleased with and that certainly we are grieving for you O Ibrahim the very famous hadith but it shows you this shows you the commitment of the Prophet to the cause it shows you that he's been tested with the most severe things imagine your child dying he saw this he witnessed this and he was grieving over it and he was crying over it once again a psychopath doesn't cry like this of these things that there's nasty things they say about the Prophet it couldn't be true he was in severe pain when he saw his son dying in front of him. Al Abbas actually was the one who washed him. Al Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet, he was the one who done a ghusl for him, for the son, and he was putting. And by the way, there's a very interesting narration which is connected to this narration, which is a woman came to the Prophet, uh, she, she, was, she was there in the graveyard and she was crying of her son, and uh, she was screaming and, uh, and so on. The Prophet left and she came back and she was told who he wa what was going on, who Prophet he was. The Prophet told her that don't cry. Don't cry. And she said that you don't feel the pain. You don't, you don't know how I'm feeling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we know now that she, the Prophet did know how she was feeling. Yeah. Look at how she responded and how he responded. Because he went to her house and he said to her, she came to him in fact, and she said to him, you don't, you know, I'm sorry about this and so on. But then he gave her a piece of advice. That certainly patience is upon the first strike of the calamity. She didn't realize that he was the prophet. Somebody she told didn't realize, her exactly. yeah, that he is the prophet. But and then she regretted it. Absolutely. A sabr and the sadmatul ula, that certainly patience is upon the first strike of the cal calamity. Saying that and not experiencing improving that would be one thing. Yeah. But we know the Prophet ﷺ showed, look at this. When the, when the boy died, Ibrahim a.s., when he died, she, he was very, yes, he was in pain. But he wouldn't say anything which wouldn't. Uh, was, the, was it with Ibrahim? Yeah, uh, for when there was an eclipse and they said it was. Yes, yeah, so I was going to get to that. So th you know, there was an eclipse, and this is something we use in Adawa a lot. Yeah. That if there was an eclipse, and the people said that you know it's, it's eclipsing because of, yeah, because of the death of Ibrahim. Yeah. So the Prophet could have been an opportunist and said, okay, well, yeah, that's absolutely the case. But actually, what happened is that he said that you know the sun and the moon they have their own orbits and they don't eclipse for anyone's death. Yeah. Mm. So which shows you that. This once again is an authenticating marker of the Prophet's uh, marriage or oh, his, uh, his prophethood. Prophet. Uh, so, you know, with that story, you know, the woman was sort of crying and she didn't really, w she wasn't in the zone to accept advice. Mm. Uh, and when the Rasul saw that, he just left Walked her alone. Away, yeah. He didn't feel the need to, you know, argue with her mm -hmm. or tell her, you know, who, do you know who I am? Uh, uh, so uh, that was the first thing. And the second thing, I, I actually, actually a question. Uh, did Rasul name him Ibrahim because he loves the, yani, the Prophet Ibrahim or who chose the name Ibrahim? Yeah, I'm sure. Um, yeah. Is that it's a good way of thinking about it. I don't see any reason why not. It makes sense, doesn't it? What was the cause of that? We don't know. I mean, it doesn't tell, it doesn't, I haven't come across anything. Uh, I don't know. One could Natural, like, uh, Natural death. Uh, why Rasul uh, when he saw her crying, um, like it, uh, like uh, I, I know that uh, when she is crying, Rasulullah gave him nasiha, and uh, she replied with uh, I reply at that time that like anni, uh, something like this, like a strong uh, unacceptance of what's happened, and Rasulullah left, and then when she came back, Rasulullah said the sabr and the sabr ula, because I um, once some might said, uh, but Rasulullah cried also, so why uh, uh, like. Um, he asked her to not cry or something like that, but uh, it, uh, I think the hadith showed that she she was in a state of um, not controlling of uh, of the incident. She was yelling and doing something like. Yeah, it shows you there's ex there's acceptable limits yeah. to panicking and grieving yeah. in Islam. Yeah. That you don't act yeah. like you know what I mean. You can yeah. cry, you can show emotion, but our religion tells us that you you can control yourself. So do it. Don't be don't be too much. 
And this goes with everything. If someone dies, if something happens, don't be, don't do, go too far. And the Prophet ﷺ manifested that. He didn't just say that. It wasn't lip service. The fact that this happened in his life is a manifestation of that. He showed how to do it. But uh, uh, there was another incident. Yeah, but the Prophet ﷺ didn't say don't cry. He yes. said, Ya'amat Allah, ittaqallah wasbiri. He showed patience. So because he went beyond. Yeah, limits. Yeah, beyond patience. What we call tasakhut. Showing a type of grievance. Screaming, not yelling. Or this. Yeah. Uh, is yeah. there a second controversy about when he used another wife's bed with Maryam? No, that uh, one, you know that one already. No. Uh, that, that one, okay, so, uh, you know, everyone knows the sort of Tahrim, Lima Tuharimu Ma'ahalallahu Laka Tabataghi Maldata Azwajik in Surah Al Tahrim, and there's two opinions of what's happened here. Uh, why do you, you make halal, why do you make haram what Allah made halal in order to try and please your wives? And some say Ibn Kathir chooses the story of honey. And he says that it's because of the honey story that basically Hafsa and Aisha have teamed up in order to try and say uh, that uh, his breath doesn't smell so I'm very good because of the honey that he's eating and so on. The honey that he ate in the house of Zain ibn Jahsh. Yo, there you have it. See? Yeah, so you see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that, was, that was the issue. That was the issue. Zain ibn Jahsh. So it's not about the honey. And the other one is controversial was that Hafsa mentions, and this is the hadith itself, there's a long way of the hadith, and there's a shorter way of the hadith. The longer one is daif by all standards, and I've checked it myself. But the shorter one is that effectively, uh, they came to the Prophet said that you came, uh, Hafsa says, that you came on my bed, on my night, on my fidawri, on my turn, and you took your, uh, Maria Qibtaya and was intimate with her. Um, yani. Now, th this is not chosen by the Mufassirin as the reason for this verse coming down. But the hadith itself, there is discussion of its authenticity. So a lot of them do tahsin of it and so on. It's not at the sahih level, but the longer riwayah is, there's a very long one and that one's weak. But there's a shorter riwayah, which is, which is, uh, which is, more, which is more correct. So guys, today we've, we've covered uh, some very important things. So as we, let's just do a quick uh, brainstorm of what we have covered. So what do we start with today? Prophet's wife's Zain names. Zain which, which one was the first wife we covered Khatija. today? No, oh, today. No, Zainab bin Jash. Jash. Okay, and what did what are the conclusions of that particular marriage that we covered? What are the the wisdoms of that one? That's basically um, they went to war. Um, so, sure oh, oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, sorry, okay. sorry. Yeah. Oh, Zainab, uh, Zainab bin Go on. Yeah. Uh, actually, we discussed the controversy about uh, the the marriage of the Prophet with the. Uh, wife of the uh, ex wife of uh, Zaid ibn yeah. al Haritha, yeah. and we said that the Prophet sallam, tried to uh, keep this hidden, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed it by revealing a verse about the dedicated verse. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned this himself that I have uh, married her to you, and you were trying to uh, keep it hidden, and then. Uh, uh, we married her to you, I married her to you, and it shows that the Prophet ﷺ, uh, uh, didn't uh, somehow trick Zaid to marry her wife, or let's say they were already, mm. Zaid lost his interest, uh, he didn't want it her more, excellent, excellent. and then uh, uh, Zainab was somehow divorced, let's say, mm -hmm. close to divorce, and he divorced it, and then the Prophet ﷺ married her. So, we put light on reality that yes. somebody m may say that the Prophet forced Zaid because he was his son and he might like her wife, his wife, and then he, uh, he married her. That's that was not true because Zaid was already uh, uh, lost his interest, lost the, the lost all the mm. let's say the issue that he had with. Mm -hmm. uh, he already let's say what's the word for that? He already. Uh, lost the interest mm -hmm. he didn't want it her more yeah, yeah. and then Prophet Sallallahu married her there's no problem with that <laughs> yeah. and also yeah. we said that it shows that mm -hmm. a man can uh, marry the, the wife of his adopted son mm -hmm. because his adopted son is not like his real son and by the way just, just a, a point on this uh, there are some marriages in Islam that people don't know who would find awkward that can take place yeah. Let me give you an example. Let me give you a few examples, not to sound too controversial at the end of this roundup part of the session. But for example, say if I, let's just, uh, if I had a brother, okay? Mm. If I had a brother and then 
it's going to be quite awkward here now, isn't it? When your brothers are here. I was going to say, like, for example, if I, if I was married to a woman and then I died, can she marry my brother after I die? Yes. She can. Yes. Now, for me, that's more of a controversy in many ways than, than this marriage, if you think about it, because mm. blood. Okay, like, what's for example, if I marry a sister and then yeah, she dies, she uh, dies uh, you bought, but you cannot marry them both at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. I marry two sisters at the same time. Twins. No, no. no. Hey, two sisters, you cannot marry at the same time in polygamy. Do you understand? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Also, for example, if you marry a woman, let's say she's a widow, and then uh, uh, you can marry her son's wife. I think that's also permissible, I think. Mm. But I mean, nowadays, well, we, like a lot of, uh, sorry to say, like, for example, if I marry a, you know, I'm not saying me, okay, if somebody marries somebody and their friend. Yeah. Yeah. Or someone marries, like, you know, a, a, a woman marries a man, and then something happens to him, and then she marries his friend. Yeah. yeah. All of that is permissible. <coughs> now, and that is, in many ways, it's more controversial in the present time yeah. than, than this. Yeah. In many ways, it can be. Marrying a cousin. Mm. Now, in Islam, you, you can marry a cousin. Now, obviously, you might not have known this, but there are some scholars that say that marrying a cousin is makruh. And because no, of and the, uh, conclu and no he says that, for example. Yeah. And no he says that marrying your cousin is makruh. Because he says medical that. Medical condition. Can, no, not that. He says that it can cause dispute within the family. Yeah, and but that, yeah, it's interesting, but these are marriages that are allowed in Islam that in general, anyway, are more controversial than probably, you could argue, at least somewhere on par with that. Uh, polygamy itself is on par with that, frankly. Mm. Nowadays, people are making that into a controversial yeah. issue. Do you know, I, I feel like it's becoming less controversial with the, this red pill movement. Of course. It's, it's actually less controversial. It's actually an advocate. It's a driver for yeah. people liking the religion, surprisingly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, 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 a, it's the times. Depends on the demographics. Yeah, it's, it's the times yeah. and the culture of the day, really. Exactly. So in 100 years, maybe half the stuff we're talking about is normal. Like, good idea, normal, good point. So, yeah. so that's the first thing we mentioned. What's the, what's the second one so, we mentioned? Just to add on, we Pardon. did mention the principle of embarrassment. Excellent. That's a really good point. <coughs> yeah, what which is uh, uh, sort of... Um, if you have an adopted son, uh, it's a, it's sort of considered your actual son in our Arab culture, and it was considered taboo to marry the wife, ex-wife of your son. Uh, so this was also introduced to reinforce the message that no, he is not your son. Excellent. Uh, this is also reflected in the Quran where it says, "I know you. You know, I think you've already mentioned this. Uh, culturally, this is unaccepted. They will find it taboo, but you have to say it either way." And so that's the principle of See, embarrassment. See, mashallah, that's really good, man. You know, this is, um, alhamdulillah. What's the second wife we went through? Joeria. Joeria with Hadith. So, Ali, tell us about her. You were saying something. Yeah, so basically, um, they went to war. Uh, with you know Sallam. what's the name of the tribe? Oh, I... Uh, Banu al-Mustalaq. Banu al-Mustalaq. Banu al-Mustalaq, okay. yeah. Yeah, uh, so yeah, they went to war with Banu al-Mustalaq and um, we thought the father died, but he didn't, uh, Sheikh Ujjadi said. Uh, but some of the... Family you know members were captives. Um, Al Harith. Al Harith. Yeah. Okay, inshallah, I'll knock that down. Uh, yeah, so he wasn't killed, mm. but some of the, her family members were taken captive. So obviously, we know from the prophetic tradition that sometimes he would marry. So, like, if there's disputes between two individuals, um, so obviously the companions took some of um, the, the wife's uh, family members as captives. So when he married her, he gave her an option, which. Um, what happened before he got married? Was, uh, oh, she 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 was she was in a, an blame. agreement to get her freedom by who? Um, by one of the companions. What's his name? I don't know the name. Do you know his name? Who knows his name? No. Nope. Was mentioned. Thabit ibn Qais. Yeah. Okay, inshallah. Yeah. Again, I'll note that then as well. Yeah. Third thing to note that. Uh, so yeah. Um, uh, so he sh he was in an agreement that she's going say to try. Thabit for now. Thabit. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So uh, with the companion Thabit. So he she was going to get her uh, freedom from him, which Allah mentioned in the Quran that make the contract. Um, but before uh, that happened, she came to the Prophet Sallam. The Prophet Sallam could have used that to his advantage and say, now I will take that on board. But rather he married her. And if we look at it, if if, if she stayed as um, a, a concubine or a slave, it would have um, maybe be better for the Prophet Sallam. But he rather took her as a, as a wife. What did he give her? Um, the, I don't think choice. Uh, he gave her a choice. Yeah, exactly. He gave her a choice, and she she chose to marry him. When she married him, that meant that the companions said, "Okay, we can't. How we're going to have the in-laws of the Prophet's wife as 
um, captives, so they let them free. What if someone so, says that she got Stockholm syndrome, bro? Like, you know, well, obviously. let's say she has Stockholm syndrome, no problem, because uh, what it shows is that she still has her faculties to make a decision. Mm. It doesn't negate that. Um, that's number one. Number two, I think from another different angle, what it's, you it, it, may, it, it may have, yeah, exactly, like from there, because it, it tells us, it makes us now want to question and understand the, mm. the thinking process, the psychology of a woman um, to do this, because it's not just the first time, this happened many times, it happened in Khaybar, mm. it's happened today, it's happened in history. So we need to now uh, diagnose and understand what in a woman's biology that she willingly, willingly is making that choice to, um, you know, be with the captor. Um, another thing which yeah. I believe maybe be a benefit out of this is because sometimes there can be resentment between the two tribes, should you say. This has now so that yani, got rid of that tension because now you're in laws, you're married. So it could have caused further bloodshed. They might have wanted to come after uh, revenge later very on. Good, so good. now it's like, you know what, we're family mm. and now it's only helped Islam grow further. Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, one uh, last person we mentioned is Mary al Khabtiya. What great uh, nation did, um, was she sent from? Uh, Ahmed. Egypt. Oh yes, and uh, <laughs> what what great city was she sent from? Alexandra. <laughs> what was the name of the? Uh, Mokokis. The king. <laughs> and what? What's the thing about nationalism? Uh, tell us a little bit about two things you would take from the story, uh, especially vis-a-vis -vis the, uh, the death of the Prophet Sallallahu son Ibrahim, that you would use to prove Islam is true. Well, first of all, when the eclipse happened, when Ibrahim died. He, the Prophet Sallallahu could have used that as an opportunity to clear, yeah, like, prophecy. yeah, it was like a prophecy. This was for me, my son. And people were talking about that at the time, but he dispelled those claims and said, no, the sun and the moon has its own orbit. And the second thing... What about the emotional side? Yeah, the second thing is that he was very... He was grieving a lot from the death of his son. And he he said he said well, something. he showed something. What was it? He called? showed patience. Yes. And there's even the story of the woman who was at her grave and she was wailing and going beyond the limit. And the Prophet Muhammad said, "Be patient." And she said, "Excellent." Uh, you don't know what I'm going through. And then he kept silent. And then later on, she he showed temperance, yeah. and that's one of the virtues that we spoke about in the second session. And um, it's about self restraint. And the point is, is that you'll see that a lot of the attacks of the Prophet Sallam want to paint him out as a desirous man. A man that cannot control his emotions, that cannot control his desires. But someone who's able to control himself in one of the most uh, calamitous moments that anyone can imagine, which is that his son died, and show that level of self-restraint when that immense level of grief was overtaking him, is not the kind of character okay, who would acts in so impulsively with their desires and so on. So these are the things that we've covered today. I hope everyone has found this as stimulating and enjoyable and interesting, as I think all of us have. And the next session now we're going to move on, not to the wise of the Prophet, but into the wars of the Prophet. And the first one obviously is Badr, but there's some things that happened before, which we're going to discuss. And that's going to be another area of controversy as Everything is, almost everything we discuss is uh, in these sessions. Well, that's the point of these sessions. These points, so we can actually discuss the elephants in the room. Make sure to tune in next week. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.